Hi, and welcome back to Expert on the Spot. I'm Adam Zeidel, and I'm just completing my ICNC PhD program at the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Brain Sciences at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I research deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease in collaboration with Hagai Bergman from the Institute of Medical Research Israel Canada and Svi Israel from Neurosurgery at Hadassah. Um, I'm going to answer your questions about deep brain stimulation. Thank you very much for the many questions that were sent. Um, first, I will say thank you for the, there were many responses that said, well done and good luck and things like that. So thank you very much for those positive responses. Just before I answer the questions, I'll just recap that deep brain stimulation is surgery that is performed on advanced Parkinson's disease patients, during which an electrode is implanted deep within the brain in a region called the basal ganglia. Stimulating that region constantly alleviates the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. To the questions themselves, David and Noah asked very similar questions, and they both asked whether patients have to be awake during surgery and if the procedure hurts. This is a very good question. In fact, this is a this is currently under research here at our institution by Dr. Ayal Raz from Balinson, and patients do have to be awake during the surgery. The reason they have to be awake is because we're recording neuronal activity, the activity of the brain, and if the patient is asleep or sedated during that recording, the activity will change, and this will compromise our ability to localize the optimal region within the brain to implant the electrodes. So for that reason, a patient has to be awake and has to be responsive. Does this hurt? Is this painful? Ironically, the brain itself does not have pain sensors. So the electrode going into the brain does not hurt at all. The only part of the procedure that may hurt would be drilling a hole in order to insert the electrode into the brain, but that is performed under local anesthetic. So the patient does not feel pain. How long does it take to actually see the results? That was the further question of David and Noah. This also depends on the patient, depends on the particular circumstance. Generally, results can be achieved immediately but it takes a couple of weeks or a couple of months in order to tune the stimulation parameters to the particular patient. And that is done by a neurologist. Our next question is from Deborah, who asks, is it known what, the causes, what causes Parkinson's or whether it's hereditary? So Parkinson's is a combination of both environmental factors and hereditary factors. There are specific genes that have been localized for Parkinson's disease, but it doesn't mean that a person with that gene will definitely develop the disease. And it doesn't mean that a person with a disease has that gene. So it's really a combination. A particular gene for Parkinson's may make a person more uh, likely to develop the disease, but it definitely will not make it 100%. And um, there are environmental factors that have been isolated that also lead to Parkinson's disease. So it seems to be a combination. Um, our next question came from... Um, Via, through the American Friends of the Hebrew University and they asked a question regarding essential family, familial tremors of the head and neck. Essential tremor is a different disease to Parkinson's disease. It's a disease also in which there is shaking, in which there is tremor, but with a different pathology to Parkinson's disease. We also perform deep brain stimulation for essential tremor. Typically we go to a different region, a region that is mainly affected in essential tremor, but deep brain stimulation does work for essential tremor. We are not currently researching essential tremor and deep brain stimulation, but as I said, it's performed on a routine basis, also here and, and around the world. And the people who asked the question mentioned that they're from Beth Israel in Manhattan, which actually have a very good DBS, deep brain stimulation center, very experienced people as well. Robin asked, my mother, has had, my mother had the surgery three years ago and just had the batteries replaced. Two questions. Is there a point where DBS stops working? She's only 69. And any news on battery lifespans? So just to explain how this works, the electrode is implanted in the brain, but the stimulator itself sits external to the brain, generally in the shoulder, and that sends the pulses to the brain through a cord that connects from the stimulator to the brain. So the batteries don't sit within the brain, the batteries sit within the shoulder. So replacement of batteries is actually a very minor procedure. The lifespan of batteries is obviously dependent on the technical capabilities that we have till today, and that is dependent also on the stimulation parameters. 
And obviously, once the batteries reach the end of their life, they have to be replaced. Hopefully, with technical advancements and better batteries, they will take longer and longer before the batteries die and reduce the amount of times the patient has to come in and have that replaced. It's typically every couple of years today. Robin's other question was, is there a point where DBS stops working? Typically, there's no point where DBS stops working. It continues to work and continues to provide symptom relief. But unfortunately, the disease continues to progress. So it might seem as if it stops working or just because of the development of the disease, the patient will get worse and worse as time goes on. We have to remember that deep brain stimulation does not stop the disease, does not cure the disease. It just provides symptom relief. So you could view it as taking the patient's symptoms a few years back. So as the con patient continues to advance in his disease, the symptoms will continue to develop. Donato, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, asks if it's true that eggs can lower the chances to develop Parkinson's disease. I've never heard of any research connecting eggs to Parkinson's disease, but what has been shown is that coffee and possibly even smoking can slow the progression of Parkinson's disease or reduce the susceptibility to Parkinson's disease. That doesn't mean that one should drink coffee and definitely not smoke because that has other health side effects that, that are more important. Next question is from Amalia. Amalia asked if gamma activity affects the cellular um, connectivity and through what mechanisms. So actually the, the basal ganglia, which is the region um, damaged during Parkinson's disease, primarily uses gamma for transmission. So gamma is inhibitory, it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. What this means is that the way that the mechanism of the basal ganglia works is that you could view it as the brakes, as stopping movement, as stopping action. And this is done through gamma because gamma is inhibitory, it prevents action. And when the system doesn't work, what happens is the resulting effect of Parkinson's disease is too much inhibition of movement. And therefore the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which are akinesia, the lack of ability to move, bradykinesia, slowment of movement, as the main symptoms, and not relating to trauma and bradykinesia, which are also symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So in answer to your question, gamma is clearly involved in, this, in, in Parkinson's disease and in, in the pathology. Um, and in fact, that is, the that is the reason how deep brain stimulation came about. Because before deep brain stimulation, it was thought, in fact, Chagai Bergman from the Hebrew University was the first one to show that lesioning the subthalamic nucleus, which would relieve the gamma excess inhibition, could alleviate Parkinson's disease. That is today our target, our main target for Parkinson's disease the subthalamic nucleus, but we do deep brain stimulation instead of lesion. Valeria asks, how does deep brain stimulation work? So that is clearly the million dollar question, and it is, there is no clear answer, it is in debate, and it is a subject of current active research in the world, and there are differing opinions. So as I've just mentioned, lesion works, as has been shown, so one would think that deep brain stimulation would mimic a lesion, would mimic destroying the region. But that's also ironic because stimulation is stimulation, it's not lesion. So it seems that it's a combination of stimulation and lesion. That the stimulation seems to also suppress cell activity, but at the same time stimulates other regions of the cell, the axons for those people who are more familiar with, with cellular with neuronal um, physiology. So it seems to be a combination of both inhibition and stimulation. But if, you, if I were to explain it in simple terms, you could look at it as a radio station. A radio station that has a song that you're listening to. If the noise is very low in the background, you can hear the song. Whereas if the noise gets more and more, eventually you'll just hear noise and you won't hear the song. So the song is the activity, the movement of a patient. And the noise is the Parkinson's disease, preventing the movement. The way deep brain stimulation works is by suppressing that noise. But the basal ganglia become noisy, they become overactive. And deep brain stimulation reduces that noise, allowing the movement to take place. Sarah asks about dopamine and acetylcholine and how they differ differently affect the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So dopamine actually is a complex neurotrans neuromodulator it actually enables movement, and the lack of dopamine prevents movement. 
um, which is the symptom of Parkinson's disease, the main symptom being akinesia, lack of movement. Sarah asks about tremor, but tremor is actually only apparent in some patients and not in all patients. And the main, um, I would call it the, the main symptom that you see in Parkinson's disease, the most, de main, the most debilitating symptom is akinesia, the inability to move. So the lack of dopamine leads to that inability. Acetylcholine is more related to tremor, and that is why drugs that are anticholinergic alleviate tremor. And this brings us back to something which was, which was spoken about a while ago for, for a long time, and is seemingly there's still truth to it, and that is the balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. Current therapy, medical therapy, before deep brain stimulation, prefers, prefers giving dopamine, dopamine um, either through agonists or through dopamine itself, levodopa, as a treatment of Parkinson's disease. Our final question came from Harriet, who asked, would this work on a 78-year-old academic with Parkinson, but a lucid mind? So, actually, Harriet, you're, you're touching on something here which is very important. One of the criterion for deep brain stimulation is lack of cognitive decline. So, patients who are older, the older patients get, and if there is any cognitive decline, that is a negative indication for the success of deep brain stimulation. So it's very much up to the, um, the, the neurologists and the people and the psychiatrists and the neurosurgeon who actually do the screening for deep brain stimulation to make sure that a patient really isn't too old and doesn't have any cognitive decline. If the patient doesn't have, in addition to other criterion, then the patient can still, be, um, can still, be, can still have deep brain stimulation surgery. This would be a good candidate for the brain stimulation surgery. I'd like to thank you all for your very interesting questions. I very much enjoyed reading them and answering them. And also thank you very much for watching Expert on the Spot.